greetings once again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our panel interview with the seven nominated candidates for Bishop of the Lacrosse Synod ELCA. The second part of our virtual candidate forums leading up to our online Synod Assembly and Bishop election on June 11th to 13th. I'm Steve McDougall, Synod Vice President and Chair of the Committee for the Bishop Election. As we know, the election of a bishop in the La Crosse Area Synod must include candidate forums since it is still against medical advice for us to gather in person for such forums, the Synod Council authorized the committee to develop a substitute. This panel interview with all the nominees is the second part of that substitute. The first part, a series of video interviews with the individual nominees is still available for viewing on the Synod web pages. Our thanks to Professor Eddie Kim of English Lutheran Church for bringing his technical expertise to producing these videos and to Reverend Barbara Brunau for making all of the arrangements for our video productions. The seven nominated candidates in this video session are in alphabetical order, Reverend Meg Hoverston, pastor to Middle Coon Valley Lutheran Church in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Reverend Libby Howe, assistant to the Bishop of the La Crosse Area Synod and Director of Evangelical Mission for the Synod. Reverend Felix Malpica, pastor to Faith Lutheran Church in Janesville, Wisconsin. Reverend Steve Meyer, pastor to Emmanuel and Wilmington Lutheran Churches in Caledonia, Minnesota. Reverend Becky Piper, pastor to Calvary Lutheran Church in Rapid City, South Dakota. Reverend Anna Sorensen, pastor to French Creek Lutheran Church in Ettrick, Wisconsin. And Reverend Becky Swanson, pastor to Advent Lutheran Church in Morton, Illinois. Pastors, thank you all for answering the call to be nominated bishop candidates and for being part of this telecast. My friends, the nominees have all agreed to the following format. There will be seven rounds of questions. The questions were written by the committee from suggestions submitted by members of the Synod. The general topics of these questions were shared with the nominees beforehand. However, the actual questions were not. The nominees are hearing them for the first time. In each round, one nominee will answer the question first with a five minute time limit. Then the other nominees will offer their response with a three minute time limit. As you can see, a timer is visible to help keep us within these limits. We've established a random rotation so that each nominee will speak first on one question, each will be first to respond once, and each will be the last to respond only once. This rotation has also been shared with the nominees. Before we begin, let us pray. Holy and loving God, we know you are with us as we move towards calling our next bishop. Guide us, Lord. Guide these seven pastors whom you have called to candidacy and guide we who listen and ponder our upcoming choices. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With God's love and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, let us begin. Question number one is about our synod and global ministry. The La Crosse Area Synod places a high priority on our companion synod relationships and on our support for ELCA World Hunger. What leadership experiences will you bring to the synod 
to continue our ministries in these areas. The first to respond to this question will be Pastor May. Thank you, Steve. I do have one brief correction because my good members here would want me to. Middle Coon Valley is in Chaseburg, Wisconsin. I live in Faropa. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Pretty close proximity. Um, the question about global mission, I was so excited that I get to speak first on this because for me in my ministry and in my time, when I become too centered and focused on just my congregation and where I'm at, um, what has helped me is to be invested in the larger church, to remember that we are in it together. So my first exposure um, to global mission in any way was in college when I did a dig in Israel. The professor that took us there did a lot of education about Israel and Palestine. And I know you didn't mention that, Steve, but I know that is one of the passions of the La Crosse Area Synod as well, is to be invested in some of the human, um, human abuses that are going on with the good folk in Palestine. I have also served on our Senate's Peru subcommittee since 07. I got to go on the delegation to Peru, which was a blessing and just an eye opener and a reminder of how we travel together, that we don't come in and fix, that we journey alongside, that we accompany. We use the accompaniment model as our ELCA has lifted up. And we do that from learning and listening and being present. And our Peruvian relationship um, has been bumpy only in that their church has had some struggle, but we have been able to continue to support them and encourage them. And in return, they have given us wisdom and modeling of how to do a lot with a little they also have a lot of experience of how to be faith in an unfriendly environment, whether it's a social unfriendly environment or a politically unfriendly environment. Um, our Peruvian brothers and sisters are able to encourage us in our own struggles as well. So my strongest gift is in the, our companion Senate ministries with the Peruvian delegate, um, Peruvian subcommittee, and then the Czech Republic um, relationship that we have as well. I am not as familiar with that. I have been brought alongside with others in our Senate when we joined with them in 2016 in our Senate Assembly. And they also have a lot of experience to share with us of how to be church with unfriendly circumstances and how to do it well and how to be faithful and live out that faith. You lifted up hunger, which is awesome in our Senate. We go above and beyond several years ago. Now, when we did the cow thing at the Senate Assembly, I think everyone was surprised in the response when congregations get invested and everyone can relate to hunger. Um, our counties, the county I live in, Vernon County, is one of the poorest in Wisconsin. And so our individual churches are invested in hunger through food banks and so forth. And they all know folks that struggle or live on the edge. And so I think our world hunger ministry complements that really well, that we can extend from not only our own communities, but we can look out. They can understand hungry children, right? And hungry people. And so um, that's the experience. It was experience question. So that's the experience and passion that I would bring to the office. And we have awesome lay people that share those passions and lead that ministry. And so to support and encourage them as well. I still have time left, but I don't feel like I have to talk just to use up the time, Steve. So those are my high points. Thank you very much. Well, I would say global ministry is an area where I consider myself a learner, um, where I, that's my experiences from learning from others. So that started for me as a seminary student. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend a Presbyterian seminary and the school I was at um, was very 
diverse as far as um, where people came from in the world. So a lot of my formation and learning was sitting with students who were from denominations, congregations in parts of the world that I had never had an opportunity to learn about. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to have social media and to stay connected with those folks. This weekend is actually my virtual seminary reunion. So when we log off of this interview, I'm gonna to get to uh, see some of them on the screen as well. Uh, so that was kind of my first exposure to world Christianity and the, the breadth that um, our faith has. Um, as far as in our synod, uh, one of the most impactful learning experiences I had was in my first call when we were still partners with the Ethiopian church, Makana Yesu. Uh, I was very privileged to host uh, Case Aswa on Sunday morning church. Um, and boy, I learned a lot from him about the gracious of being a good guest. Um, I at that time had children in, this is a very embarrassing story, I had children in diapers and a raccoon got into our garbage and then into the car and I had a little raccoon diaper prints all over the inside of my vehicle and I had to drive the person who was essentially the equivalent of the bishop of our companion synod around in my car that smelled like a diaper and he was so kind and gracious. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it made me realize that, that there's a hospitality of hosting, but there is a hospitality of being a good guest and he modeled that so well. Um, yeah, so global ministry is definitely a place that um, I have a big growing edge, but it's been so uh, beneficial to me in the times when I've had those encounters with um, our brothers and sisters from different parts of the world. Steve, you're muted. Pastor Libby. Thank you. So um, the leadership experiences that I uh, would bring from my encounters with Global Mission um, have, have more to do with some real, the ways my international experiences have, have changed me as a person and uh, taught me some important things. Um, I would say the most transformative experience I ever had was at the onset, one of the worst experiences I ever have, which is uh, not not too surprising. I think we learn a lot from moments that are difficult, but I um, traveled to Egypt with a friend of mine in 2016 as part of my sabbatical. And um, of course I did that in July, which I do not recommend. Don't, don't go to Egypt in July. That's just a really not smart thing to do. But um, there I was, and um, what I what I learned uh, I learned a couple of things while I was there. We were visit. She teaches English in a seminary there at a Coptic Christian seminary, and so I went to stay with her for a short period of time while their term was ending. And um, what I was confronted with, I'll just be real honest, was my own sense of um, comfort, convenience, privilege. I mean, everything that I I hate about, or I think I think I hate about what it means to be American in this world. Um, there I was embodying it all. I just felt confronted by it at every turn. Um, the fact that I was the only one that seemed bothered by how hot it was, or that um, I learned a story, uh, a man, uh, one of the students had to get permission to go to the doctor one afternoon. And he came back and everybody asked, what, how did it go? And he said, uh, the doctor didn't show up today. And, and it was only the two Americans who thought that was a problem because of the way we value our time and our, our I mean, just our sense of importance to ourselves. Um, so every mo I felt like every moment, every turn I took in Egypt was an opportunity to, uh, to learn how to be a better human. Um, somebody who 
who was much less concerned about my own comfort and convenience, or at least wrestling with those assumptions that I have about that. Um, another important experience I've had was when I did go to Palestine and Israel in 2012. Um, that the learning from there is that there's never just one story. Um, and it is so easy to imagine that there's, you know, that the story we know or the story we like is the only one that matters. Um, and uh, sitting with parents who have made the effort um, from both Israel and Palestine, whose children have died in violence and listen to them, how they've reconciled and forgiven each other was really, uh, was really significant. So thank you. I see my time is up. Three minutes goes fast, by the way. Uh, Pastor Becky. So I'm from the South Dakota Synod and my experience with companion synods is with different uh, partnerships. So for South Dakota, it's with Cameroon and with Nicaragua. And I've had the privilege of serving in the past on the companion synod group, the committee that's really uh, looked at communicating and supporting their story as well as being able to travel to Cameroon, which where I served at the time was a huge deal to try to do that travel. And it was all about relationship building. It was prior to Cameroon ordaining women in the Lutheran church as well. So coming from a place where we don't wear pastoral collars very often, it's just the tradition of where I am, we wore them in order to represent uh, the Lutheran church and build those relationships. It was by far one of the most powerful experiences uh, that I had. And like Pastor Anna talked about getting the privilege of then hosting somebody and, uh, and reciprocating that hospitality to have Bishop Niwe from Cameroon in my own home, meeting my children, getting to preach at the, the small church that I served at at the time was this amazing experience, again, to be able to be hospitable in that way. So I see that this back and forth with the building up of relationships and supporting one another. It also made me very aware of trying to help from afar. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The best laid plans with supporting women in ministry in Cameroon. Uh, we tried to create scholarship funds and we were doing all these things from afar that did not work. And so it was starting again and again through how do we support uh, global missions, especially through companion synods. When it comes to uh, world hunger, the importance of hunger, I think, uh, really starts locally. Uh, we could support financially, we can have those opportunities to build relationships from afar, but it really has been for me is how does that work when we start locally? Like if you were to come to our church right now and go into our, our big fellowship hall, you'd see pallets and pallets of food. Uh, we had this big delivery made in order to support uh, native health uh, during the time of COVID. They needed a site in which to put all this food in order to distribute to various sites. So on this local level, we've been able to see how it affects people all over, not just in the midst of where we are, but open our eyes and our hearts to then think about where hunger is happening in other places as well. Thank you. Pastor Felix. Well, I will just start by saying the global church has always been home for me. Um, being born in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, the church that I grew up in, right, uh, was speaking Spanish, was dancing in the aisles, and um, it, it's something that's a part of my DNA. And then uh, I'm sure Malpica people know the name. They always ask, oh, is Rafael your father? Yes. Um, and that means that I, I grew up um, really involved in global mission my entire life. I remember as a kid growing up going to um, uh, these global global mission events, and then later I became a musician in and through those events. I was actually a part of a small team of people who helped develop the global mission formation events that later would become global events, um, which is talking about how do you be the global church in your local community, and I was involved in, in that um, 
partnership. I was a part of the ELCA churchwide mission formation visioning consultation in the last year, uh, or in two years ago, I suppose it was, as they were working on the restructuring of the ELCA. Um, but then I've had a lot of personal experiences to my church that I served in Austin, Texas. We had a very tight relationship with a uh, community in Guatemala. And so I took several groups there um, and just an amazing opportunity to be able to connect with God's people all over the world. And it's funny because being bilingual, you'd think that would have helped me out in Guatemala. But one thing you learn is that, well, it's not really Spanish. That's the, the top language there. Uh, it's another native language. So even my, my Spanish was helpful, but only so much. Um, and it's amazing what you can learn about your faith when you really do walk alongside God's people. Um, you learn how different expressions of who God is in the world uh, come to life when you can experience worship in many different ways. I've been uh, doing a lot of teaching about worship and the capacity for worship to expand our capacity for imagination with who God is, right? Because in worship, we we develop our communal image for who God is. And as long as we only ever worship within our own type of people, within our own communities, within our own languages, our own customs, um, you might paint a very small picture of who God is, and that probably looks a whole lot like you. Uh, and so it's very important that we learn to embrace the gifts of our brothers and sisters who are at work in the world through the Holy Spirit, who can show us new dimensions of who God is in the world and how God can be alive in our communities. Um, and that's been much of my work to bring that to the forefront in communities. Um, you know, I've been able to work with youth, global youth from around the world doing music. I've been able to work with um, World Hunger uh, fundraising here at the church. And I mean, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. One of the things that I did early on in youth ministry was take a group of, was it 30 high school kids to Mexico? Uh, we flew there together and did ministry of Mexico together, which most people would think would be crazy. But we had a great time. We learned a lot and we came home, back home, changed people. And I think that's what global ministry and world hunger offers to us. Thank you, Pastor. Next, Pastor Becky Swanson. Thank you, Steve. Uh, pa Pastor Felix, thank you for your part. I didn't realize your part in global mission or the global mission events and the global events. Um, those were super helpful to me as I came back um, from places like Holden Village where I learned a lot of that kind of music and to bring my congregation to those events um, was really helpful. So I thank you for that ministry. Um, as I think about the importance of global ministry, this year has been especially um, important to, for us to remember that as every congregation has moved online, we've all become part of global ministry, right? Um, because the World Wide Web is not just in Wisconsin, what? Um, or Illinois. Um, but my, there's, there's um, probably the most distinctive thing from the examples that have been shared already. Um, I was really grateful to get to bring a cross-generational group from a congregation to, to a partner um, a, a partner church in Guatemala when I was serving in the St. Paul area synod um, and, and to get to travel to Nepal to uh, observe and walk with um, folks from Lutheran World Federation with their ministries there in a place where Christianity is less than 1% of the population and um, sharing any faith is actually illegal. Um, and yet all of this diaconal work is going on. And the, the other leadership experience that I would bring into this office is my experience as a deaconess and the partnership we have in Worldwide Diaconia, which is a group of deacons from ec an ecumenical set of deacons um, that gathers every uh, so many years um, in different places. Um, and part of the group that helped host it in Atlanta in 2016. Um, and then also the diaconia of the Americans in the Caribbean. And so all of those experience, the, the uh, opportunities to travel, 
um, as well as to host, as as folks have said. But the the divergent part of my background would be that most of my experience not only has been accompaniment, but has also been getting to know leaders in those areas of the world that are working um, in, uh, from a diagonal lens. And so uh, not always um, in the in the realm of worship, although always centered in Christ, but di worldwide diakonia um, is fascinating in that in many places in the world, the church is known through the diaconate more than it is known through the worshiping community, because it's the diaconate that brings God's love out of the church into the world in those areas. Um, and so that's been really interesting to be part of. My time is up. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Steve. Thank you, Steve. Several of you have mentioned our companion synods um, and, and, and the accompaniment that we do with our, our companions. Um, 20 years ago now, I was part of a delegation uh, preparing to go to Ethiopia with some youth from our synod. And it was really emphasized to me that we go there not to, not so much for what we do for them, but to accompany them to walk alongside them. I was taught that, and yet in my head, I still had this thought that, well, we're going to go and we will do something for them. I wasn't in the country more than uh, 24 hours before a family emergency, emergency had me uh, preparing to head back home again. And that's when I learned, I really learned that it's not so much uh, our relationships with our companions, so it's something that we do for them as much as it is walking alongside, because all of a sudden our companions in Ethiopia were walking alongside me in the midst of this family emergency. In my time as pastor, I have been able to walk alongside with some of the members of our congregations, both in Westby and here in Emmanuel and at Wilmington, who have journeyed to our companion synods in Ethiopia and in, in Peru. The gifts that they bring back in sharing with the congregation uh, what they have learned uh, from, those, from those places have enriched our own congregations. Uh, I think of uh, my colleague in Westby who had went, who went and, and was amazed at how the ministry of the church there was to the whole person. And it got our council talking about how can we learn from that and work to minister to the whole person. And some things changed as a result of that. Touching a little bit on hunger, that was the other part of, of this question. Um, I work to lift that up in congregations. We've done, our Senate has done some amazing things in lifting up world hunger uh, and, and the need for the hungry within our own communities. One of the things a, a member of our church started here was a free food pantry uh, this past year as a way to reach those here in the community who are hungry. Um, and I think I'll just, I'll leave it there. <laughs>